Amen. All right. We've talked the last few weeks about the church and how is that? And I thought, well, when we look at the church, there's some things we do need to look at. And so let's go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10 tonight. So we go to 1 Timothy 1.10. Said for whoremongers and them that defile themselves with mankind, for uh, men serve. Uh, uh, I must. Uh, men, stealers. men stealers, okay. Uh, for liars, uh, for perjured uh, persons, and if there be any other thing that uh, is contrary to sound doctrine and that's the phrase i want to get to is there's things that are contrary in the house of god to sound doctrine there's things that are against it go over to titus chapter 1 and verse 9 tonight um, and one of the things that a church needs to be known for is having sound doctrine and i think day and age the sad part is is and I'm going to quiz you tonight, so you came for a Bible quiz tonight. And uh, why? Because every believer needs to have a foundation. If you don't have a foundation that's the Word of God in Scripture to back up what you believe, you are on shaky ground. You're on shaky ground. So the Titus 1.9 says, Holding fast the faithful word as... <clears throat> as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So we're going to use that sound doctrine to exhort and encourage one another and to stop the gainsayers, those people speaking against the, the Lord. So we need to be ready. Titus 2 and, and verse 1, it says, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. You know, what, what are we doing? So I thought, well, uh, you know, and th this could be a long message. So I'm going to speak on all the sound doctrines that we need to have. No, I'm not. I'm going to, I'm going to do 10 of them tonight. Uh, uh, but I am going to do 10. So we, we will go quickly. So, you know, I'm always not going to spend 15 minutes on each one. Praise God. So, okay. So, but I'm going to give you... Ten ones, and if you got a pencil and a paper and everything, I just encourage you to write these down because I'm going to ask you to do something that I think will help you if you'll do it. Now, you know, the sad part is, is I think so often we become forgetful hearers very, very quickly, you know. Uh, and the Bible tells us not to become forgetful hearers and to uh, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're commanded to study and to know the word of God. And some of you younger Christians and others, and some of you, you, you can probably do this, but the Bible says to add to your faith. I think we've been talking about that a bit, about adding to your faith. Well, you say, I, I've got faith and I, I've got three verses. Because I'm going to challenge you to have three strong verses on every one of these doctrines that you have written down. If you have them written down, if you know where they're at, that you can then memorize them so you can use them, being ready always to give an answer. And if you've got to memorize, then I encourage you to add some more to that building on your faith so you know if you got three that's great how about do you have five how about a couple more uh adding a bit more so it's very easy and i'm guilty of it as much as anybody is to become complacent in adding to you know in building up uh one of the dangers is once you become a little bit proficient <laughs> and i say a little bit uh, you think, well, I've arrived, and none of us have arrived. We all need to be adding to our faith and building upon it. So I'm going to give you ten doctrines. Get your pen out and a piece of paper, because I'm going to give you ten doctrines, and then I'm going to want to encourage you to get at least three verses in the Bible. And I'm not going to give them all. I may refer to some, and if you're quick, you can write down some notes and then look up where I found that one. But I'm, I'm not even, I'm going to, 
quote as much as I can because otherwise we will be here longer than 20 minutes, okay? So we're going to try to go quickly. So the first doctrine is the Word of God is the Word of God. So number one, the Word of God. So I'm going to give you ten doctrines that need to become sound doctrines in your life. You, you need to know what you believe about these things and what the Bible says. And I'm going to have you help me tonight with some sound verses for sound doctrine, okay? So first of all, when it comes to the Word of God, you need a good verse on the preservation of the Bible. Uh, can anyone give me a good verse on the Bible being preserved or lasting or enduring? Can anybody give me one? Yes? Um, for That's a great verse, and you can use that one later on, but that's not now. Uh, that's a great, on the word of God on the word of God that says it's being preserved, that we still have our Bible, that their Bible, that God promised us that that Bible would be around. Go you do, okay? We're moved by the Holy Ghost, the Spirit gave them utterance. Yeah, yeah still not preserved, preservation. <laughs> Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. How's that one? Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So it's preserved. You have another one. Uh, for the word was with God. The word, John 1. one. John 1. For the word was with God. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with was God. With God. Was God. And the word was with God. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. John okay. 1. John 1. John 1. Okay, that's a good verse. With God and the Word was God. Yes. I got one. I got one. Yep. Uh, Psalm 12, 6 to 7. Okay. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried and furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Okay, great one. And that also applies to the pureness of God's Word. You can use that one. Uh, the, how about the infallibility of God's Word? Tried in the fire seven times. Okay. All right. I haven't got it. You're the one that quoted it. <laughs> the infallibility or the of the word of God. Yes. Okay. All scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, right? Yep. Okay. So, yeah, great verse there. Okay. So, we have the infallibility and the preservation, and there's lots of others. Uh, Psalm 119 is a whole chapter on the, the, uh, the um, Bible and the Word of God, so and how important it is. But you need to have some that give you, because it does two things. Number one, it gives you security and the brethren around you security, but it also gives those that would attack the Bible an authority. Because, folks, we have no authority of our own. We have to have an absolute authority, and that absolute authority is that book you hold in your hand. That's God's Word. Now, folks, some people are not going to believe it, but that's okay. What's, what it is, is you have an authority. See, they have no authority, but their own, what they think. <laughs> and, you know, it's kind of funny. They're going to challenge your authority of the Bible with what they think. Now, wait a minute. You're trying to tell me that your idea is more important than God's word. Okay, all right. So, you know, it, it, it's kind of like the... Um, the junior league football player telling the guy that plays for the Broncos how to play football. You know, it's kind of like the lesser telling the older how to do it. Okay, and, and that's what it has is, okay, God's word versus your ideas. Don't think there's a match there somehow. I don't think that's a match. Okay, okay, 
it, it's, it's established forever. How about that the Bible is forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven? How's that one? Okay. And it's true. We said it was true and righteous altogether. Uh, Psalm 119, or Psalm 19. Uh, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is true and righteous altogether. More does he desire are they than gold, and yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Okay, it's true. Okay, how about studying? You quoted it. What was it? Yeah, 2 Timothy 3.16, we study to show ourselves approved. So the word of God, you need to have some verses that help you establish the doctrine. Second doctrine, the deity. The deity is God, God. Okay, how about it? Um, pardon? We're going to get to the Trinity, so I don't want that. Okay, but the deity of Jesus Christ, the deity that he is God. Because this is, this is a doctrine that is constantly under attack because the Mormons don't believe it. Uh, many people do not believe Jesus is God. Anybody who doesn't believe in the Trinity actually doesn't believe that Jesus is God. Because, well, uh, well, there is a Jesus only movement that they say Jesus is God. There isn't a Trinity, but they, it's a Jesus only movement. But there's, but the deity of Jesus Christ and the deity and that God is God. John 8, 58, quote it. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Right, okay. The I am. We know that when, and how do we know that that is? Because it took up signs, one is signs. Yes, and because when Moses asked, Who shall I sent, say sent me? He said, Tell them, I am sent. God called himself, I am. So we, we know that from there. Okay. Um, uh, you got one? Okay. Uh, two verses, actually, right next to each other. John, I don't know if this applies, but John 5, 26 and 27. For as the Father hath life in himself, so he hath he given to his Son to have life in himself, and have given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Okay. Self-sufficiency. Pardon? Jesus Christ is self-sufficiency. Okay. Which makes him God. He can only be completely self I am life. Yes. He is the way, the truth, and the life. See, people think eternal life is living forever. No, eternal life is Jesus Christ. You think about it. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Which was the point before the John 5? John 5, 26 and 27. Does that apply? Yeah. Yep. 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 You had one, Ash? You quoted it once. John 1 1 will work again here. That's a pretty good one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Oh, isn't that a good one for the deity of Jesus Christ? Yes, very good. He's pretty smart, isn't he? Okay. All right. So Jesus God, He's eternal. Before Abraham was, I am. He's eternal. Another one? Anybody? Okay. Yes. Right, Revelation one eight, great verse, and where, because he calls himself the Alpha and the Omega, which means, can anybody tell me why Alpha and Omega means he's the first and the last? Can anyone tell me that? Because it's the alphabet, and it's the beginning letter and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Very good. Okay, very good. All right. Yeah. Hey, sometimes people say, "How did you know that?" Because you heard somebody else say that one time. You know, and sometimes there's things that we assume other people know, but they've never heard it. So it's not there. So that's fine. Okay. He's, 
Um, one of the keys with Jesus being God is that he is outside of time, space, and matter. That he's not confined by time, space, and matter. Can you show me a verse that says he's outside of time? Yes, so he's always existed, okay? Before Abraham was, I am, that's right. So he, he and, in, and he is, by him were all things created. You got one? Uh, one because it said in the beginning it was the word and the word was with God. And it said in the beginning yep. was the word. Already was. And not is, but was. So it's past tense. So it indicates before the beginning he was. Right? You gotta learn your English. Was, is, will be. Okay? So, um, so he's was. So he was. Okay, another verse that shows that he was outside of time. Colossians one fifteen. Okay. Who is the image of the invisible, visible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before. Okay, so he, okay, so now we have matter that he's outside of matter because he created all matter, all things, and so he's outside of time, matter, and how about space? How can you show that he's outside of space? Because he was before the heavens and the earth. Because that's what fills space. Okay. By him do all things consist. Or the Bible literally means holding together. Okay. So some good verses. Having those. Why? Because you're going to run into people who don't want Jesus to be God. Then the Trinity. Okay. The third, third subject is the Trinity. This is one that uh, you'll battle with. I, I probably run into more people that struggle with this than any other single thing. And it's kind of think it's so simple, but it's so, and it's, it's like people think they want to think of Jesus. They want to put God as someone within time, within space, and within matter. How can God do that? God can't do anything because doing indicates something is proceeding in time. It just is. You think about it. God is. He, he wasn't and he won't will be. He is. <laughs> and the eternal nature of God is that he exists in eternity. He doesn't have a past, a present, and a future because he is. You know, and those are hard concepts for us to think of. Because our life is totally geared by time. <laughs> Past, what happened an hour ago? Future, what will happen after we leave here? And right now. And so we struggle because our whole reference point is within time. And we can't really imagine being outside of time. We can't understand not existing in matter. That's why it's hard many times for people to understand a soul why? Because we are so tied to the physical matter of our body. Yet, without our body, we still exist. I can prove if I have a volunteer, get a knife and we'll cut your arm off and see if you still exist. Cut both legs off. Do you still exist? Yes, so you aren't your body. You have a body. You have a body, but you aren't your body. That's not who you are. Okay. So, but what are some things that can give us proof of the Trinity? Pardon? In the Bible or in the... In the Bible, yeah. Verses on Trinity. Yep. Trinity are things that would show us Trinity. Baptism, Christ, the passage, the Okay. Response. Right, OK. 
case of Jesus being baptized, the Father said from heaven, here's my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And the Spirit came down, descended from heaven as a dove and upon him. So we see all three of them in the same verse. Another one? I'm going to have the reference. Okay. Um, it's about five verses or four. Uh, John 16, 13 to um, 15. Okay. Howbeit when he the spirit of truth come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, or whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. Okay, so we see the Father, we see Jesus speaking, and we see him speaking of the Holy Spirit. So we see all three. Uh, look, Matthew 28, 18. Okay. Okay, Ash? Um, be our Father. Um, our Father that art in the Lord's Prayer. Okay. He prayed to the Father. Okay, it doesn't speak of the Spirit, but it does speak of the Father. So you have two of the three in there. Um, one of the other evidences is okay. And the word yes, was Jesus God. Was yeah. with God. Yeah. So there's two persons there. Right. The word and God as the Father. Right. And Genesis uh, 1 1 tells us what? Ash, you know that one? Uh, In the beginning. Right. Now the key there is the word God is the word Elohim. Elohim is the plural nature of God. El is singular. Elohim, just like seraph and seraphim, is the plural of angels. El is the singular. Elohim is the plural. So in the beginning, literally in English, God's. So it's a plural Godhead created the heavens and the earth. And, and the Spirit of God moved upon the water. So we see um, God spoke, the Son moved. One said God the Father was the architect, the, God the Son was the contractor, and the Holy Spirit was the carpenter. <laughs> you have uh, the uh, designer, the uh, supervisor in the in the operator so you know spirit of god moved upon the water so we find all three of them working together there in creation no we're still on trinity uh worship jesus received worship as god and another deity that probably could line up with jesus being god but he received worship um uh the and of course the most famous passage the one that they hate I tell you, you always tell when they want to deny that the passage should be in the Bible and everything else, the great attack is 1 John 5, 7. And don't let them take it from you. Resist it, because this is the verse that wasn't in the corrupted Catholic translations, the Vaticanus, the Sinaiticus, and the Alexandrius. It was, in fact, it was in one of them, but it wasn't in the other two. And... It's a corruption that came out of um, origin uh, who, who did this in, in Jerome. So uh, we have to realize that this corruption, but 1 John 5, 7, very important one, and so extremely clear that they don't want it there. It says, there are three that bear record in heaven, the, fa the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. What's that one? 1 John 5, 7. So write that one down because that's what, I mean, 
how can you deny the Trinity when it says that? You know, it's kind of like there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy, Holy Ghost, and these three are one. 1 John 5, 7. So it's... The three that bear record on earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. Yeah. Yep, they're the earthly testimony. Is that the blood of Christ, the water, and the spirit of God bear witness on earth. So those are the three witnesses on earth of who Jesus is. So, yep. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, we'll keep on going. Salvation. And soul winning, salvation and witnessing, okay? Cause, and uh, we already quoted the one. I think that was yours, Ash. You started out with it, I think. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9? No, he said Romans. Okay. But Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by, you all say it with me, for by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you want to have a description of salvation, now there's the description of the gospel, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, but the salvation, I think this one makes it clear that, you know, so clear that salvation is by grace through faith. So by the grace of God, which is unmerited favor, you don't deserve it, but God grants it, unmerited favor, and by faith, believing in God's word, trusting in him. And it's, and it's not of works. It's nothing you can do to save yourself. What Jesus did on the cross is what saves you. And it's putting your faith or your belief in him there. Clear passage. But that, when someone wants to say, how do you get saved? That's a great, one of the best passages in the Bible to go to. I mean, there you know, you can't go past that one. Um, so Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, okay? So it's by grace, it's through faith, it's not of works. It covers so many things. Uh, the blood, okay? Uh, next one, the next uh, uh, doctrine is the blood of Christ. Because here's another one they don't like. <laughs> the devil especially doesn't like this one. He does not like the blood of Christ because it's the power yes without the and without the sh one of the important verses in hebrews without the shedding of blood there is no remission what 927 i think it is is that right yeah i think it's 927 in hebrews without the shedding of blood there's no remission the whole picture of offering sacrifices and shedding blood from the time of what did adam what how did when adam and eve sinned how was their sin covered? Animal skin. animal skin. How do you get an animal skin? You kill an animal. You shed the blood, don't you? It was the shedding of blood. And they took the shed blood and they put the animal skins on them. So that the first death was by God. He shed the blood and clothed them. So he covered their sins by the shedding of blood. Blood is essential. And the blood has to be a certain type. It has to be a pure blood, undefiled. So you can need to have a verse that, that Jesus, Jesus was tempted in all like manner as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus' blood was pure. And... Uh, of course, the sacrifice was always a male lamb without spot and without blemish. John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He was, the lamb was a picture of Jesus Christ, and he was declared to be that lamb when he came. So, okay. What about Revelation 22, 16? I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Yeah, that was a, that's an application of it. Anybody else have another one on the blood? Okay, or keep going. Okay, uh, the shed by death. 
Okay, it's not just shed. It's shed by death. And that's the Hebrews 1, 9, 27. It's applied by faith. And after this, the judgment. Okay, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. What is that? It's in Hebrews. It's in Hebrews. Yeah. Anybody find that one? Okay, keep looking. Those of you who are got a computer there, you can find it. <laughs> um, applied by faith. It's applied by faith. It's not applied physically. It's applied by faith. And the, the shedding of blood and the applying of that. So. Twenty-two. Nine twenty-two. Okay. Nine twenty-two. Okay. That's it. Okay. Uh, was it F, whatever that is. Minor letters, not numbers. So F, whatever that is. Five, six one, whatever. The church. Okay. We've talked about the church quite a bit the last few weeks. Okay. It's local. It was operational. The testimony to that in the Bible is. <laughs> All the churches were the church at Galatia, the church at Ephesus, the church at Rome, the church at Jerusalem. They were all had a locale. The best is the churches of Galatia. Yes. Because Galatia is a bridge. I think that's the best illustration of how it was local. It was independent yeah. Churches. It wasn't just the, the people in the, the, all the churches made the church. It was separate. So it was churches. So I always say this. The church is operationally local, and we see that. Its, uh, its association is independent. Okay? Its association is independent. We're not associated with other churches. We are independent. But our affiliation is the household of, God, of faith. I'm affiliated with everybody who is saved by grace through faith. So I'm affiliated with them, but my association is limited to here. I think you see the difference in those two? So, um, and we, we see that. Um, obey them that have the rule over you. Well, first of all, either you've got to obey every pastor everywhere, which that'd be really hard, or every pastor has authority over everybody, like the Catholics teach the Pope does. <laughs> well, they have the rule there. They're the leadership in the church. So just there can be mul well, there can be multiple pastors in a church. Many churches have multiple pastors, and they have that authority, and they also have that responsibility and accountability. But they only have it to the people of the church. So. You, Understanding the church, because this is a concept that today has really been messed up, because everybody, they want to have universal acceptance, but local accountability and response, and no accountability and responsibility. They want no one to rule over them. They want no one to lead them. They want to do their own thing, but they want to be accepted by everybody. Well... If you believe every, do you believe everything that everybody teaches? Mm. So, you know, you can't have it both ways. They want their cake and eat it too, literally, <laughs> on this whole thing. So submit yourself. So, okay, so we got that. So uh, having that. Okay, then the next doctrine is the second coming. Now, you know, this is, this is a real harsh one of mine but i believe what we need to understand about the second coming is that jesus is coming again and he promised that he would come again and the principle of the second coming and our belief and our doctrine needs to be this that i have i must be in preparation and that preparation for his coming means holiness you don't tell me you believe in the second coming of the lord jesus christ and live an ungodly life because obviously you don't hey if i'm coming over for dinner 
I would hope that you'd have bought some food, right? So if Jesus is coming again and you believe it, I would hope that you're preparing for him to come again. So prepare yourself and you need to have some, doc some verses on that. Somebody talks, start talking to you about eschatology, ask them, well, do you believe the Lord is coming again? Well, therefore, are you living holy? Okay, you need to have a verse on holy. They, and there's quite a few verses on holiness shall not see the Lord. Okay, then the second thing is it's consolation. The second coming produces consolation or consoling. It's comfort. He said, comfort one another with these words. Right? So the promise of his coming is a comfort to, the, to everybody. So you need to have a verse that shows comfort. And then it's um, anticipation. And there are signs of the Lord's coming. And you need to know the signs of the Lord's coming. And be prepared in knowing that. So having your lamps trimmed and burning bright. Okay, well, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We need to have our lamps trimmed. We need to be ready. And while I have some very strong personal convictions of when and how it's all going to happen, that doesn't matter. It matters that he's coming. Now, some people make how he's going to come more important than the fact that he is going to come and a false balance the bible says is an abomination to the lord keep the emphasis on the important things on the big things not the little things people get them mixed up we, yep Amen. Okay, we'll get to you. Okay. Um, isn't there a song that we sing? It's like, Jesus is coming. That's a good song. <laughs> Marvelous blessings we bring. Glorious carols we sing. Wonderful words of the King. Yes, Jesus is coming again. Coming again. That's the song. That's a good one. Yeah, and I tell you, and I get a blessing out of songs because so many of them, they're just a a consolidation of the word of God, a scripture, the good ones are? Yeah. I've got a question for you. Okay. How do you know them by heart? How do I know them by heart? Because <laughs> I have sung them for 40 years. When you've sung them for as long as I have, you start to learn a couple of them. A couple of them. <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell you something funny that my friend said about the rapture? If it happens in his song? Let's do that. Oh, okay. Say it. Say it. Say that, okay. Uh, great. Then the next one I want, next doctrine is grace. Grace. Uh, there is a real, there's a misuse and a, needs to have a proper understanding of what God's grace is. Because for by grace you're saved through faith. And understanding that grace is not um, achieved by you. It's given by God. It's a gift of God. It's the gift of God. It's um, the promise of God. It's the work of God. We need to understand that. And it's given to man. It's from God to man by God 
as a sovereign. And the sad part is, this is where grace gets twisted. There's, there's a group called the Sovereign Grace Movement. And, and, and basically, it's a Calvinist under another name. <laughs> and, uh, and frankly, you probably need to understand the Calvinist and Armenian doctrine. You need to understand a bit of that. If you're going to fight spiritual battles, you have to understand those two. And frankly, they're both wrong. They're both wrong. And uh, they both teach. And the funny thing is, is I always, people say, are you Calvinist or Armenian? I say neither. Uh, you know, what were people before the 15th century when Calvin and Arminius came along? <laughs> they were Christians, that's right. <laughs> they were, you know, it's kind of like, oh, we couldn't be something else because, you know, what did we believe before that? Well, we didn't believe either of those things. It wasn't until those guys messed it up that we, people started believing those things. And you know, one of the great dangers is, is when someone has a systematic, because, hey, I, I knew a pastor, he was a very strong Calvinist, and he literally, you can get Calvin's systematic theology, and it is like, 10 books and he sat there that was his family devotions with his family now but praise the lord he had family devotions but that's not the bible and he taught through um calvin's systematic theology you know well praise the lord the guy wrote but he didn't write right you know and Arminius, the people are struggling today hoping they're saved not knowing they're saved. He said, these things have are written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you might know that you have eternal life. Salvation is not I hope I'm saved, it's I can know I am saved. And you wanna teach a no-so salvation and you wanna get that right. And grace teaches a no-so salvation, but it also doesn't teach of a thousand and one ways I can sin and get away with it because I'm under grace. Shall we sin, Romans 8, 1, shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. <laughs> you know, Paul made it very clear on that. It, was, it isn't, uh, I know we had some guys sit down with us one time at a conference and they were Armenian. And they said, we always thought Baptists were guys that believed a thousand and one ways to sin and get away with it. You know, they thought because you believed that you were saved because of God's grace, you could sin, it didn't really matter because you were saved by grace, you know? And they had been taught that, oh, yes, if you believe that, you can do that. So what do they have to do? They had to keep their salvation. They had to keep on keeping on. They had to do their good works. And see, that's the other side of the grace controversy is that, oh, well, if you don't keep, hold on to it, you're going to lose it. No, you can't lose it. And so you probably need some verses on that as well. Okay. Can I just ask a question? Yep. Well, they say they believe the Bible, and mind you, and here's one of the keys that a false doctrine is they will define terms. If I can define four terms for you, as the Calvinists define it, I can make you a Calvinist. And this is the, the little snare they get. If I can get you to believe in predestination, as I teach it, foreordination, election, and sovereignty, if I can define those words for you and tell you what they mean according to me when i start reading the bible you'll start reading and say oh yeah that's what it does say but is it in the bible those words are but not the definition that they use that's not fact. That's yeah not see we're foreordained according to the foreknowledge of god and they say well see god just god says neville you're going to be saved and Paula, you're not. See, this is the God they have. They have a sovereign God that chooses whether people are gonna be saved and gonna be lost, and you can't do anything about it. Uh, my Bible, and here's what my Bible says. My Bible says, now they ignore this, and they, in fact, I'll show you what they say. It says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, let's see, uh, I'm trying to, he died for the sins of the whole world. And I've even had a Calvinist tell me, he says, that means the whole world of the elect. No, that's not what the Bible says. He said he elects him and he doesn't elect this one. 
So see, they say election is God choosing and picking. No, God, because he's, again, here's understanding a God who's forever. God knows who's going to call upon him by their own free will and choose him and who's not going to. Because it's not future for him or it's not past for him. It's now. Well, they, Everything. well they basically elect themselves to decide. That's it. Well, they choose. They call upon the Lord. Okay. It says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't say whoever God chooses is going to be saved. God knows who's going to be saved because he knows everything. What, what uh, does they say to that? Huh? What does they say to that verse that you just mentioned? Oh, well, they say that, um, that it's the elect. It's the world of the elect that are going to be saved. No, no, I mean, Which one? The uh, uh, name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, they say, well, it's because God elected them that now they can do that. I was in a Calvinistic church one time, and one of the guys used to be the deacon of the church until the, the new preacher who was a Calvinist, and he said, uh, everybody, would you pray for me? He said, um, I'm waiting for the Holy Spirit to draw me uh, and, and call me. He said, uh, I need to accept the Lord as my Savior and everything, uh, but I'm waiting for the Holy Spirit to draw me. He un <laughs> well, that would be a work of His. But see, it's the work of God. He, you can't do anything. You can't have an invitation because that may be a good work. See, it, it allows for no response of man. So, yeah, so this is a whole... Understand, be careful when someone starts down the road of the teachings of any one man. And those, that's where the danger goes. Because they usually, and one of the, always the danger is they define some terms and tell you what they mean. And then if you accept that, you fall into the trap. You fall into the trap. Okay, um, got a couple more here. Uh, heaven and hell. I think this is, excuse me, the last one. Heaven and hell. You need to understand, because there are people out there like Seventh-day Adventists who do not believe there's a hell. Now, Jesus spoke more about hell than he did heaven, so they have a problem. Jesus mentions hell more often than he does heaven. <laughs> real life, huh? Yep. So, and uh, hell in judgment, it's a literal place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Those aren't spiritual worms, and that's not spiritual fire. It's not allegorical. It's a real place with real fire and real brimstone. Okay? It's eternal, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. It's eternal. I got, one. got another one? Uh, Revelation 21.8. Yes. Another place it says, which burneth forever and ever. <laughs> yes? Well, I think that's actually a, that's a question. Um, how many times in the Bible can you recall that the lake of fire is mentioned? Is it just Revelation mostly? I'm trying to think if there's another place at the lake of fire. <clears throat> It's only like one or two verses in there. But there is a bottomless pit. But that's the home, I believe, of Antichrist as he's wait, awaiting his return. It's, I believe it's Judas's place. He went into his own place. Yes? Um, Revelation 20, 10 and 14. Okay. Um, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and Brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night, forever and ever. Okay. And death and hell were cast unto the lake of fire. This is the second death. Okay, and that's where all those that have not the blood of Christ and salvation by grace. And yeah, people don't like that. Man, they'll say, well, hell means the grave. Hell means... It's Sheol, and they, they'll play around with words. But 
I, I, that Dake's Bible that I've brought up for some of your study notes, he's got one in there, and if you ever want it, I'll photocopy the page for it. 89 reasons why hell is, or the grave is hell, or hell is the grave. You know, it's, it's not just, <laughs> you know, it's not just a place where you die, and they, they call it soul sleep. They don't, you know, they just go into never. No, your soul liveth forever and ever. Yes. Yep. Um, 50 and 51. I think that talks about the tribulation time. Yeah, but and the, the Olivet Discord, yes. Oh, sorry, the, yeah. the Lord of that servant shall come in the day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Yes. And uh, he talks about the Pharisees will see, receive the greater damnation. There's degrees in hell as well as rewards in heaven. Remember, the Pharisees received the greater damnation. So it's going to be worse for some people. People say, well, I'm just going to live like the devil. I wouldn't do that if I was you. <laughs> it's going to be bad enough for you as it is, let alone making it worse. Yeah, he, he, well, that's for the judgment. Uh, yeah. Brought for the judgment, yeah. Okay, and so finally, um, know, know about your adversary. Know about Satan. Heaven and hell, and I guess the last one was Lucifer. Yeah, the last one was Lucifer. And know about your enemy. Know about where he comes from, where he's gone to, what he's going to do, his devices, that he goes about the roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, that he's trying to deceive and to and false prophets and you need to understand the works and your adversary and understand your enemy and avoid him or reject him his origin his fall and uh, your defense and it's the word of god and the blood of jesus christ so all right go on see that was only an hour <laughs> i crammed 20 minutes into an hour <laughs> but uh, i think I, I like it when people are in their Bibles. You need to know that your Bible is your weapon. It's, it's what you have, folks. God has blessed us so much. You realize there are people who didn't have a Bible? And uh, when people behind the Iron Curtain, when it was an Iron Curtain, they would literally take, they'd get one book of the Bible, and each person, would, they would smuggle it home, and they would write it out by hand they would memorize it completely and many of them would only have one book sometimes they come to these churches and they only had one book of the bible or a part or a few pages of scripture that somebody had smuggled in and how precious it was we got the whole thing and well no i didn't get time to read it today really really let's hide god's word in our heart let's use it okay we'll need to go quickly we need to do do we need a church business meeting